Hello. Hello. We're live. We think we're live. We might be live. <laughs> Hopefully we're live. We're live from Cherry Duck. Hello and live. good afternoon to you. Apologies for the slightly delayed uh, start. Um, Dave was wandering around next door at the nest uh, with I James. I was. Went and had a look around the nest. And um, so we had to quickly cool cut that together, um, which delayed us slightly. But anyway, we hope you'll find it interesting. We've got lots of things on today. Actually, we have got, got so much to talk about in the show today. It's going to be absolutely jam-packed. I'm not sure how we're going to get it all in, to be honest. Well, you're used to talking too much, so that should be absolutely fine. So, um, I have my list of things here, so I don't forget. So, we're going to scoot straight on to the news. The news. The, the news, news yes indeed. So this has been a busy old month actually, to be brutally honest. We've had an awful lot of things announced. So first of all, Panasonic G9. I know you don't really use Panasonic, mm -hmm. you don't know much about it, it's a camera, but um, you like the GH5? I did like GH5, I was impressed with GH5. Okay, sure. okay, so the G9, we've got a quick bit of VT here we can roll just to explain okay. a bit about it, so perhaps we could do that then, please Trev. Okay, so that's quite interesting. Now, yes. the interesting thing is there is the sensor isn't basically any different from the GH5s, mm -hmm. but what it does is it effectively takes different images, four different images with the sensor, um, by shifting the pixels it's around the pixel as well. Shift, exactly. It? Um, and then effectively producing an 80 megapixel still. Now, mm -hmm. some of the images I've seen so far seem to be pretty good. Yep. And there's a few people that have um, used it who I know actually aren't people who would say that it's brilliant unless they actually thought, thought it was, was quite okay. good. And it seems to be very impressive. What's interesting as well is that 200 mil 2.8. Which is effectively... a smaller sensor, that makes it, what, 400 mil? 400 mil 2.8, yeah. And that's quite interesting. Now we're starting to see um, more of the mirrorless guys coming on um, with much better sort of telephoto lenses, which of course will lead us to something that we were, um, <laughs> you'll see we talk about a little bit later we on do. when we had a look at the A9 and the 1DX, but you know, that's obviously been a bit of a flaw, mm -hmm. um, the longer telephotos, the fast telephotos, and it obviously seems that they are now starting to come. Yes, I think that's going to be uh, a bit of a shift in the mirrorless systems actually, I think. It's something I we know that they're missing and we're going to hopefully see them add to. Yeah, and I think once you sort of also take into account five-axis image stabilisation, which we both know is actually pretty good, mm -hmm. it's pretty impressive on not only the Sonys but also the Panasonics, yeah. it's going gonna, it's gonna to be quite interesting when we really get to play with those lenses. I think it's going to open up some possibilities that, that maybe weren't there before. So, also uh, announced this month, um, the next Sony, well, it was pretty obvious that it was going to come at some point, was the A7R. Three. And again, another one that came with two more lenses, the 24-105mm. Yes. We recognise that as a Canon user. Mm -hmm. And also a uh, 400mm 2.8. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, yeah another uh, one. Yes. Now, Sony haven't actually, um, they've said it's being released. They haven't actually sort of shown any images of it, but it is on its way. Um, they've confirmed that it is going to be released. Okay, when, um, when are you getting them? Well, once they're in stock, effectively. Okay. Once they're in the country, we'll have them. Um, so we're going to just show you a little bit of detail about the A7R III. I think this is quite an interesting one. I think you'll really enjoy this. And we're going to do an 85mm shootout, 
We and are. I think that this will be an interesting one. You think we're going to do 85 with, with this camera? Sony G Master with this camera okay. against the, your 5 dsr with the new Canon 5 85. 5. With the, um, I think <sighs> that's going to be an interesting one. So, yeah, I think we're going to do that one, aren't we? I think we're going to have to. It's going to have to be done soon. Yeah. Go okay. to a portrait shoot somewhere. So let's have a look at the uh, A7R Mark III video so you can get some uh, idea of what it's all about. So, another interesting one. Um, you already know about what the IAF's like on the A9, which did impress you, didn't it? It did impress me. You're going to see a bit more about that uh, in a wee while when we show you our video from Brands Hatch, where we put the A9 up against the 1DX Mark II. And I, I have to say, in all honesty, yes, I was quite impressed uh, with the A9 autofocus. It performed very well. But we're going to talk about that a little later yep. on. I don't want to get carried away. Yeah, no, 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 definitely. Now. But the point is, is now take the bigger sensor, well, or rather higher resolution sensor of the A7R as well, which we know is a cracking sensor. Mm -hmm. Put that in it as well. Put a nice fast lens on the front of it. Mm. It's going to be very interesting. That's going to be really interesting. I'm really looking forward to it. As I say, the 85mm is going to be yes. a good one. But yes. again, 400mm f2.8. Yes. Again, as we, just, as we just talked about with, you know, um, with G9, we're now looking at fast lenses appearing, fast long lenses appearing, yeah. um, which, you know, it shows that the mirrorless system is really kind of growing up. Mm -hmm. um, all the manufacturers are, are feeling the same thing. They need to add to their lens range if the, if the mirrorless is going to continue. Yep, uh, definitely. And it's not just the manufacturers themselves. Obviously, third-party suppliers are another one. And obviously, we had Sigma announce their 16mm f1.4 E-mount. So another remount lens to add in. And actually, do you know what? For what it is, it's extraordinarily good value when you start to look at some of the uh, Sony lenses themselves. Um, it'll be interesting to get our hands on that and see what that's like. Um, Zeiss, new Milvis, 1.4, 25mm. Um, we've got the whole Milvis range. I think 
if I'm honest, a lot of it's a bit misunderstood with the poor old Milvises because actually, do you know what, optically they're brilliant. I just think that some people, uh, it's bizarre really, I suppose because they're EF and um, Nikon um, F mount, obviously people are using them as SLRs and of course no autofocus and so therefore they back off from them a bit. Sure. I think take one of them, mesh bones adapter and use on a mirrorless camera where you've got peaking, um, suddenly it makes a lot more sense. And I think we're going to find that the Milvises will come into their own with the EVA, uh, with EVA 1, because suddenly we've yes. got E-mount. If you're looking for a good value um, lens to use on the front of that, mm -hmm. uh, manual lens, because it does need really manual lenses, um, as we'll discuss in a little bit, um, I think that the Milvises will be a really nice uh, one to go with it if you don't want to go up to a full cine lens, because sure. they're quite a lot cheaper. So I know you're getting the EVA, and I know we're going to talk about that in a minute. Yeah. We're thinking kits, Milvus and Eva, possibly? Yeah, yeah, very much so, very much so. And we will touch on kits a little bit later because we've been changing a whole lot of stuff on the website, which will go live in the next week or two. We're furiously composing things at the moment, so we'll mention that. We'll just finally finish with this, which is the Fuji e uh, XE3. Sorry, raining gear. Um, now... It's an interesting one, this one. Um, I really like it, really, really like it. Um, now, obviously, the X-Pro2 and the X-T2 get all the headlines because those mm -hmm. are the pro cameras. Um, and, you know, this... I, I just like it. I think it's really nice what and compact. What is it you like about it? What do I like about it? I like the fact, for a start, we've got nice aperture on there. Manual aperture. That's, that's nice. Fuji okay. all through. Yep. I like the design of it. Um, I find it very nice. It's, it's not heavy. It's a good size. Mm -hmm. I just, there's something about Fuji stills cameras that just, they have a look about them. Now, whether you use the RAWs or whether you use one of the film modes, yeah. um, they take beautiful images. Now, you know, they were guilty in the past of, you know, the AF not being so fast and that kind of thing. Um, it's not the case anymore. And what I also like about Fuji is the fact that they do firmware updates. They don't demand that you have to buy yet another camera. Sure. They do constant firmware updates throughout it. And, you know, their engineers are so, so keen on trying to please. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they will happily listen to everything and anything to see what they can do. And we saw it with the X-T2 when the X-T2 came out. It wasn't that long before another firmware update came out as a result of mm -hmm. the pros saying, well, we want this, we want that. And it's just refreshing, dare I say, some other manufacturers could possibly be encouraged to do the same. Okay. Um, which would be rather nice, rather than possibly charging May I? for it. He is. He's not let me have my hands on it yet. Yeah, well, it's literally straight out of the box, that it one. It is. I, I was I actually playing with it. Over, yeah, I was actually playing with it over the weekend. Um, but nice camera. Nice camera. I just, I wish more people tried them. I really do, because I think they're really nice. Um, okay, so that is all the new bits and pieces that have been announced since we were last here. Um, a little bit of horror camera news, if I may. Yeah, go on then. Okay. I'll let you. Well, that's very kind of you. So, Click and Collect. Uh, we have already got Click and Collect at Cherry Luck here in London. And it was only a matter of time before we expanded it. And we have done so in the last month. We have added uh, Tiffin at Pinewood. Right. Um, We've got six more. Let's see if you get them all right. <laughs> so, we've got Tiffin at Pinewood. Mm -hmm. And then also London Camera Exchange. You can now collect kits from London Camera Exchange at the following. Cheltenham, Chichester, Winchester, Norwich, Norfolk, and... Norwich is in Norfolk. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Norwich and Newcastle. And one more. And I've forgotten Come on, one. the Essex one. Also begins with C. Chelmsford. No. No, Colchester. Colchester. Sorry. There you go. Oh, sorry. I knew you wouldn't get them all. Uh, do you know what? I practiced this many, many times and I had them all in my head. And do you, you know why you got it wrong? Because you changed the order that you'd said them before. I did, I did. Anyway, so you can now uh, basically book online. When you go to book online, rather than choosing your delivery address, you can go to collect from, put your postcode in, and you can then choose one of those places to go in there. Um, the guys at LCE are brilliant. They're lovely people. Um, and you can collect from them and drop it back to them as well. Um, need any ancillaries, memory cards, that kind of thing? they'll always be happy to supply you with those as well. So, yeah, I think it's absolutely brilliant. I'm really, really excited about that because I, I like LC as a company. I think their um, they're shops, the people that work there generally yeah. like cameras, yes, which is always I nice. Was, um, 
only, only last week. I was actually doing some presentations at the LCE Pro Show in Lincoln. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, I always enjoy going up to LCE. They're always nice, nice folks to deal with. They are indeed. So that's the first part. Uh, next part is packages. We're completely changing all the packages on the website and how they're delivered. You will find that um, we are putting the packages more specifically underneath the actual main model pages themselves, which means that rather than doing maybe one or two packages, we can now do an infinite number with every different model. So, um, and effectively, it'll, we'll be building them up as we go along. So, with the camcorders more specifically, I suppose, um, you'll be able to add map boxes, uh, rails, um, lens packages, um, whether it be cine lenses, um, whether it be uh, zooms, whether it be primes. So, we'll work out what goes and we'll offer that as a package to try and guide people a bit more because it is very complicated, all the rails and the it's support it, systems and everything else. It, it can just, be an absolute minefield. It is. I, think, I think people get very confused and bogged down and, and there's so many bits that you might want to add that people never quite know what to choose. So this will hopefully a bit of a path through that minefield. Uh, hopefully so. So that should be live in about two weeks' time. As I say, we are furiously working away trying to put all the packages together but as you can imagine it's quite a lot of work so we will get them out and we will be continually adding to them as we move along so new kit in stock i'm feeling very poor i'm not surprised the amount of new kit you've got coming in stock i, I can't tell you just how much stuff we've bought in the last month so to try and run through it as quickly as i can uh we have new filters coming on board from both tiffin and lee okay uh, why both? Well, the reality is is that they're both very good at their game and some people prefer one, some people prefer the other. Okay. Um, and also we're covering stills and we're also covering video as well. So you'll see 4x4s, you'll see 4x5, 6.5s mm -hmm. and then obviously 100 mils. Um, there will be different holders right. on both sides. So obviously we've got matte boxes by Bright Tangerine, uh, again 4x4, 4x5, 6.5s, Misfits, Misfit Atoms. Um, then we've got some other holders by Wooden Camera as well. Then on the still side of things, we'll have Tiffin, we'll have Lee, and we'll also have One Country Camera, which uh, okay. you know about as well. Yeah, so the one that followed our road trip will, will exactly. saw us using the One Country Camera. Holder. Exactly. Now, the great thing is with all the packages, we can now link everything properly, which will mean that actually it takes, hopefully, the confusion out of exactly what works with what, what bolts onto what. So we're sorting that out. Um, then RX zeros, RX zeros here. Um, <laughs> Dave wants to steal that one, don't I, you? I, I really want one of these. This is so nice. Yeah, but I think it's misunderstood. I really do think it's misunderstood because the reality is is that um, everybody looks at it as being possibly an action camera, and I think that's totally missing the point because. Um, first of all, image stabilisation. Now, we know that the GoPro 6, um, Hero 6, has taken image stabilisation that further level now, and it's much better than it ever used to be. Um, but this doesn't have it. Um, now, for some, that'll be a real issue. For sure. Some, but I think, some will be a that, I, I think the reality is, is that, you know, I mean, Tom very kindly tested it for us, which the video went out, it's coming back in shortly, because um, <laughs> he forgot to mention the fact that it doesn't record in 4K internally, which was a bit of a blunder, but there we are. We'll get that sorted. So, um, yeah, of course, no 4K internal. Mm. But on the other side of things, the image quality out of that absolutely knocks the GoPro for six. Yes. Um, it's stunning. Um, the interesting thing was also we found, that the, uh, we found that the audio on it, Dave and I were playing with one in your van, Brenda, in my van, in Brenda, yeah. indeed, and when we went down to Brown's Hatch, didn't we? Exactly. And we had one of those actually fixed on the windscreen, and we thought, well, we'll just give it a go and see what it's like. And actually, interesting enough, the image, the, sorry, the, um, audio. the audio out just of it... Just built-in microphone. ...was <laughs> remarkable, because Brenda's not that quiet. She's, she's not the quietest beast in the yeah. world, no. She's so not. it was really interesting to see that that was quite impressive. And the other thing you've got to try and remember is, is that it isn't GoPro, so therefore it's not as wide, so you're going to have to push further back. But where people have been locking the you know, normal cameras off for uh, shooting in car stuff, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, I mean, we do quite a lot of GH5s for broadcast or corporate purposes for that very reason. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see that working really well because it is so small. If you don't need the 4K, 
the HD out of it is beautiful. Sure. Um, so I, I think that they'll, you know, they'll prove popular, but not for what people expect them to do so. Mm -hmm. Not possibly for no, action I think, stuff. No, I think it is, you know, there's going to be a whole other market of people wanting smaller cameras, not just the action camera market. Yeah. Um, and and uh, as soon as people get their head around it, I think these things will fly because, I don't know, what, I mean, it's a box, right? It mm. looks like a little box, but it's a really nice, it's a really nice little box. Mm. It feels nice in the hand. And as you say, the image quality and the audio quality from it was, was really good. So. Yep. And we've got, we've got lots of different uh, options for it. We've got a cage that will go around it, so you've got... Um, half and three eighths all the yeah. way around, so you can bolt it to or put anything on you want. Yeah. As we said, it's got 4K out, so I mean, yes, you could put an external recorder on it if you really wanted mm -hmm. to. I mean, actually, enough, we were talking about it earlier, but I mean, we're just using uh, XF3 uh, 205s today um, to shoot this on. But there's no reason why we couldn't have just used three of those and HDMI out. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's the quality on it is second to none for what it is. Okay, underwater, we've got an underwater housing here. Um, this goes down to depths that, quite frankly, most human beings can't go down to anyway. So um, it's built like a brick proverbial. I, I do have to say, it's quite big, frankly, for, for, for this being so tiny and, and this being its housing, it is quite a big housing. Mm. But something that I was very pleased to see was it has a filtering on the front of it. Yeah. So if you wanted to stick a very ND on there to give you a bit more control, um, that's, that's, that's a really nice touch. It shows they've thought it through. Yeah. Um, it's well, nice, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. I'm impressed. So we got those. We've bought some more Hero 6s. Um, they've been going out. So we've bought some more of those. Um, Nitros, the Nitro tripod yes. that we had in the States. They're back in stock. Okay. They're all back. Finally They're all back, back on the tripods again. Okay. Whatever it was that happened, don't know, but basically they're all back. Um, so we've re replaced all of our uh, advanced pro tripods. They've all got uh, nitro heads on them, mm -hmm. and we've also got some separate ones, uh, three leg carbons as well with nitros okay. on, which are a bit lighter. Fabulous. It is, it is a very nice head for, for video. Yeah. It's really well designed, I think. Um, yeah, should be popular. So then Ronins. Um, we do quite a lot of Ronin stuff. So um, we've got the MXs, we've got the Ronin, and we've got the Ronin M. And now we've got the Ronin 2, um, which recently come out. And in fact, actually, yeah, Ronin M here, we've just been um, boxed, we've been using for putting stuff on. Um, I was using it as a footrest, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, Ronin's. Um, one question we did get asked was about the Ronin 2. Are we looking to get some kind of easy rig for it? The answer is yes, it's already ordered. Should be about three weeks away as far as I understand. Um, because it is quite heavy, especially if you put something decent on it. But, yeah. Um, so yes, there is one on its way. I will mention more about it as and when we've got it. But yes, already being dealt with. we'll have that for the next show. I hope so. I look forward to walking around with it. Okay, more Panasonic and Sony lenses. I can't tell you how many I've bought. <laughs> we've bought so many. Um, Sony GM Master Lenses, we've, I think, certainly doubled, if not trebled, our stock of um, in the last month or two. And Panasonic's, we're buying more Lumix lenses as we go along. And we really are, I mean, we've definitely increased. We're still short, apparently, because there wasn't 100 to 400 mil available to bring here. So I will buy some more, that's fine, but just to let you know, we are buying more of them uh, to keep up with demands with the a new A7R that will be coming out, so A7R 3 and obviously A9s, we've bought more of those. Um, so I am trying to make sure that we always have uh, constant stock of everything. Please, please, please do contact us if we haven't got something because I will try my very best to get it. MCX 500s, now, uh, Trevor, behind the uh, camera over here, is using the MCX500 that we have from Sony. Um, this is, in fact, its first outing. We thought it would be a very good test for it to find out exactly what it was like and find out its foibles. If you've been following us, you know that we do tend to just throw things in randomly, see yeah. if they work and, and, and live or die by the sword. Well, the reality is that everything that is in this room is our stock. Mm -hmm. Everything we've got here is supplied by us. So there's no better way to test it than to try it. And it's been an interesting test. And we are going to do a video on how to set it up because, believe me, I've learned an awful lot in the last 48 hours on how to set it up and the do's and the don'ts. But you've got to be impressed. Literally, out the box, 
pretty easy to use. Do you want to actually tell people what it is? Because MDX okay. 500 really doesn't that's, explain an awful that's lot. That's a very good point. So this is the box. Whoop, where are we going? Right, here. So this is the box for the MCX 500. I'll hold the box because you're not that big. There ah. you go. Then, then people can still see you. How's yeah, that? Cheeky sod. Right. So the MCX 500, it is a switcher. Um, it is a live switcher. Um, you've got uh, four SDIs, two HDMIs, um, XLRs, um, and yeah, so that you've got various different inputs. You can mm -hmm. control them. You can connect up to a uh, laptop via an Ethernet connection. Then you've got remote and setup of everything. Now, the version 2, which we haven't got at the moment because Sony couldn't get it to meet in time, the version, version 2 firmware, firmware. Yep, okay. will allow you to put a logo on as well, which you okay. can pull off the SD card. Um, and also, most importantly, it'll stream to Facebook. Now, this isn't streaming to Facebook off the uh, M6500. This is, we're using the uh, Teradek Video Pro today. Okay. Uh, so we're just taking a PGM feed straight out um, into the Teradek, and then we're using that. However, I'm assured it's not far away, and once it's on there, you will literally be able to go and configure on your laptop, straight out of there, plug an Ethernet connection in, and you're ready to go. Um, so are you seeing this, we're thinking this is going to be the future of kind of Facebook Live, if you want to do the Facebook Live type stuff, yeah. this is going to be the way to do it. Well, there's two things here. Um, the reality is, is that you've got, um, you can obviously use existing cameras connected into this, you can use three camera setup, four camera setup as you want. Um, the other thing is, is we've got the Sony Z90s on their way. Mm -hmm. They have the ability to stream off a single camera straight again onto Facebook, YouTube. Okay. And yeah, we are definitely seeing more of that as we go forwards. People are wanting to use it. Facebook at this present moment in time is a great platform and it's free. Yeah. It won't be forever, I'm very sure of that. But whilst it is, um, for okay, people to well stream. The shines, right? Exactly, exactly. So I think that makes a lot of sense. So. Um, we are using the MCX500. It is available to heart. I would just like to point out at this present moment in time that we're on version 1 firmware and so it won't stream to Facebook at this present moment in time. But as a switcher, it's really, really useful. Um, yeah, I think we'll find that these will become... Um, obviously, yes, we're going to do packages. So we'll basically throw in three cameras, tripods and everything else and everything you need to connect it up. And then we just need to do a bit of a video so to explain it, how to do it. It will just be a, li a live stream package. You wish yeah. to live stream, take this, off you go. Turnkey solution. Pretty much everything you've got here. And this all came in the car today. Yeah, it did. Yeah. And your car's not the biggest. No, it's not. So there we go. Right, that's the MCX500. Um, we will move on very quickly. Uh, C200s. Right, we're going to talk about C200 in a minute. Um, but we haven't got any. I'm really sorry. Uh, well, we have. We've got four. But we haven't got any at the moment. Okay. In fact, actually, one literally was being picked up about half an hour ago and is being taken off to do a shoot and do a case study as we speak. And that I had to move heaven and earth to try and work that one and fit that one in because that had to be done by this week. So we have got them. I apologise. We have got quite a few of them, but they are, like most things, when they come out, people want to play with the toys. They want to try they're them. They're exceptionally popular. And, and so they are. You know, it's understandable why, because they, they are a great camera. Yeah, well, we're, we're going to, interestingly enough, talk about that in, in, a, in a little bit. Um, so, what else have we got? EVA 1. I suppose you can't talk about C200 without oh. talking about the EVA, can we? Wait. <laughs> I have got one here. So, you had a little play with this earlier. I did. You know, we were talking about this in the last show, weren't we? And the fact that, you know, they are very different beasts, really, the mm -hmm. C200 and the EVA. Um, or EVA 1, as they're supposed to be called. Uh, in terms of the difference between them. But I think, you know, there's a nice point in the market for both of them. Um, we're, we're already quite inundated with demand on them, as we are the C200. So, you know, there's definitely a place for both of them. This is very much more of a manual camera. Yep. You haven't got the AF on it. You've got incredible codecs on it, though, in its, in its defence. Um, it's not really need much in the way of defence, because actually what it does is extraordinarily good. We like things like the uh, um, Focus Assist, Yes. With the squares, that's yep. very nice as well. I mean, it, the first thing, you know, you kind of think is it sort of feels very much like an FS5? Yes, yeah, I'd go with that. I mean, interestingly, the f was the first thing I said when I picked it up? Oh, I like the hand grip. The hand grip's really nice. It feels good in the hand. It does feel like an FS5. Mm. Um, it, it, it's got that kind of feel to it. it there I say feels a little plasticky. But we know, we know that the Panasonic 
always last better than they feel they will yes, do. We know that's the sure. case. Um, yeah, I don't think it's something to be worried about. It was just a, it was an initial reaction. I like the layout. Um, I think, as you say, I think it's going to be very popular, and I think it does fit. It, it has a place in the market. Definitely, definitely. Uh, something else that has a place in the market. One of these. There you go. Let me put this down. Um, okay, so we we, we kind of. Um, we had an interview with Mike Tapper at IBC and spoke to him about the uh, uh, Micro Four Thirds mount for the Fujinons. Um, this is one of our lenses, so we've already got them now. Um, this is one of them that Mike very kindly converted for us. Um, so we've got both um, sizes, 50 to 135 from the 18 to 55, um, designed to be used with GH5. A very nice package. Very, very nice. And uh, speaking of packages, we will obviously be doing packages on this. Um, bolting a, uh, a Chogun Inferno on the top. Uh, Ninja Inferno, rather, uh, for HMI. So, really, really nice. Gives you a very nice solution. And not desperately heavy. No. And actually surprisingly well balanced. I mean, very I, nicely balanced. I, I think, um, you know, my honest opinion is it looks a bit strange. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's bouncy, it's but I think small that... Small camera, big lens. But, but I think we're, we're all coming used to that now. We are. It's becoming more common. Um, I, I like the fact that these are all geared, ready. I think as a video solution, it's, it's quite nice, actually. Yeah, very nice indeed. And interestingly enough, we were here last week. Um, was it last week? Can't remember now. Week last, last week, week before. We were here at Cherry Duck um, with an open day for Fujinom. And we shot a uh, few bits and pieces of BTS, but we also actually grabbed some time with Jim Marks, who is a GH5 shooter, um, who had a chance to uh, shoot with Fujinon Lens to see what he thought of it. Mr. Jim Marks. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, sir. Good. So we find you at Cherry Duck today. Yes. We're all here for a good cause. The Fujinon cause. Yes. Yeah. Now, I've known you for a little while, and I've known you to shoot a few bits and pieces, a few different bits and pieces. So, 1855, what dost thou love about it? I'm glad you've spoken to me in Shakespearean terms, because um, um, it, it is the way I think, um, Millard. Um, what is good about it, I'm going to start with the first thing, is it weighs very little. And I know that seems silly, but it weighs nothing. It really is very lightweight. So it can go on all sorts of clever things. I also personally like the fact it's totally manual. Mm -hmm. Okay? No electronics. It's just all there. It's a, it's a cinema lens. It's, I think the key thing to say, it's not a stills lens. Mm -hmm. It's a cinema lens. Um, so we have a proper focus throw. We've got proper markings. And uh, yeah, it's designed for making films. Now, it would be easy for people to think that because it's small and it's lightweight, that might have an effect on the quality. But it doesn't. It doesn't because... I don't know about you, but I've always been told size is not important. Um, I'm ever hopeful. I, indeed. And, and just like this little thing, this powerhouse of a camera, the GH5, can do amazing things, so can this. Okay? It's, yes, it's light, but that just adds to what you can do to it. Um, don't confuse that with not producing a great image or being usable. Okay, and in terms of the, the when we call it a cinema lens, I think it's quite good to explain the difference because a lot of people in your, your, your kind of backgrounds, they've used um, photographic lenses in the past, or you know they still do for different purposes. So could you just explain what that means in terms of you know, focus breathing, parfocal, yeah, what does, exactly, what are these terms? You're using all the good touch, touch points. I, 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 I've got I like, a big list up there. Have you? <laughs> That's good. Uh, um, parfocal, what does parfocal mean? Let's start with that, okay? It just means that when you focus, you zoom in and you focus, and you zoom out and zoom in again, it keeps focus, okay? When you use a stills lens with a video camera of any description, it's always a bit of a compromise. Yes, you can get great results, but it is a compromise, and stills lenses aren't parfocal, and they breathe. And by that, I don't mean <laughs> breathing like that. What I mean is the image shifts as you pull focus mm -hmm. from one point to another. Uh, it's slightly unsettling, whereas a proper cinema piece of glass should pull focus gently, between, I'm asthmatic, by the way, that's why the breathing was so heavy. Um, pulls focus without breathing. Yeah. Okay, so, um, but also in terms of focus throw, uh, on a stills lens, and this is the, a big thing, if you want to pull focus between two points, often you've only got that 
or maybe that, which is very, very tight. This has got a 200 degree focus throw, which means that I can really hit the point, come back, hit the point again. You can really control the focus. Um, once you've used one of these, you kind of never want to go back to a stills lens because it's you can see why all the bits work. Yeah, well, that's what I was about to say. Is yeah. The problem is, once you've used one of these, it's very hard to You're go You're ruined. Back. You're ruined. Now, I mean, I can see on your setup there, you've got a follow focus on there. But I think, uh, you know, a, a lot of people have this preconception, you have to have a follow focus if no. you've got a cinema lens. But that isn't true at all, is it? No, no, no. In fact, some great focus pullers just use the barrel. So, you know, I've just done that for ease. I mean, yes, absolutely, I've stuck one on there. But you can equally just turn that and pull on that. Just, just put your hand on the top. Exactly, and pull just like that. Yes, you don't need, um, I've slightly pimped my rig, if I could say, um, because I love to do that, but you don't need to. No. Okay, and another thing that people might be a little bit apprehensive about, of course, because it's a cinema lens, it's manual focus. Now, I think that it's quite easy to convince people that with a decent enough lens that's easy to handle, that it's yeah. quite easy to pull focus. And I think that most people would be surprised at how easily they can pull focus. Would you agree? I would. And also you get this thing called muscle memory, which I, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. This is not me spinning you a yarn. OK, but you do. Um, if you've got a decent you know, focus move, you actually learn. You just do it a couple of times and you'll, you will hit that mark every time helps if you haven't had eight pints the night before. But if you can avoid that, okay, you actually do. And the beautiful thing about manual focus is it's you controlling it. Mm -hmm. Even the best f autofocus in the world, well, it's the, it is the computer and the camera doing it. This is totally down to you. So you decide when you want to move or not. Do you know what I mean? And I, I like it. It's a great way to shoot. So we've also um, got the fact that that has a focal range on it. It's not a fixed prime. No. How much of an advantage is that in the field when you don't have to keep changing it? Well, it's a great advantage. I think it's interesting. Years ago, we all bought primes, and primes are great. But we're kind of, here we are now, and these zooms have actually come down from what was an astronomical amount of money. I mean, a, a cinema zoom five, ten years ago, we were talking £15,000. Do you know what I mean? So too much money if, to own, if that makes sense. And I think as the price of these zooms has come down, as there's competition in the marketplace, suddenly, and as also as the quality, I think it's a key thing, the 4K quality of this glass means that actually if I can get four focal lengths conveniently in a cinema zoom, I'm going to go that way. Because it's going to cost me more money probably to buy four primes. And then it, you're exactly right. When the director says, can I have a wide shot? Can I have a tight shot? I've got to say, excuse me, just one second while I change the glass. With this, I don't. Yeah. And there's a big brother to the 1855, isn't there? There is. There is. There, there is the 50 to 135. That's right. Um, which is exactly the same size, uh, which is really important because going back to your earlier point, if you want to change lenses, it takes seconds because your follow focus, your map box, and all of that are the same size, same position. So you, can have, you could even have a swing away map box if you wanted, even quicker. So yes. And I noticed on the front of that we were talking, we were talking earlier about pimping it up a bit. I mean, you haven't fully pimped it because you haven't gone map box tastic and everything else on the front of it. But you haven't been, haven't had to for one good reason. Yes, yes. Well, th this has taken me months in a dark basement to work this out. But finally, what I've worked out is, I've got, you know, I've got a GH5 which doesn't have an ND. Okay, it's not like an FS7 or an FS5 with it built in. And if you want to work outdoors and it's bright and you need to have an ND, I'm thinking, how do I do it? How do I do it? Obviously, I can put a big map box on the front, but I've got an SLR Magic variable ND and it's got a little handle. And I managed to unscrew the handle. And when I did, it fits inside here, inside the actual um, mount that comes with the lens. So actually, I've, built, I've now got my variable ND inside the, you know, the, the physical dimensions of the lens. I just put the cap straight on, take it off, job done. Fantastic. Oh, it's brilliant. I, and it is it's sort of quite important to point out here that Fujian have been quite clever and they've made a nice practical diameter. Um, most people will have so 82 mil yes. um, variable NDs already to exactly. hand if they've been using Canon glass or yes. anything like that. Yeah. So it's more than possible they'll have something all fit on the front of it. Yeah, exactly. So, which, which is, and also, even the smallest map boxes make everything that much bigger. When you put, you know, everything starts to grow, um, which is all right if you've got a very big camera and you're going down that route. But these lenses are so light that you're going to tend to use them with smaller cameras like FS5. 
you know, FS7 and GH5. Yeah, exactly. And so um, I think most people have noticed by now that there's a GH5 on the back of that, and most people will have worked out that a GH5 is in T-mount. How's that work? Uh, via the magic of the small pixie cave. The magic of the tapper. Yeah, that would be the Mike, the famous pixie um, who, lives, who lives in his little cave going tap, tap, tap and creating special mounts, which is exactly what he's done here. Um, bless him. He's, uh, he's, we've changed, taken the E-mount off. This is not a radical change. Okay, we've, he's managed cleverly to remove the E-mount with just four screws and then he's created a new one for Micro Four Thirds or for FZ mount as well and that goes straight on. It doesn't damage your lens whatsoever, but it just opens up other camera platforms to this glass, which I think is fantastic. Now, we were talking about this earlier. I mean, the GH5 lends itself really nicely to this lens, doesn't it? it? It does. And it doesn't have a manual zoom that fits nicely like this. That's, I mean, I actually weighed these. these you know, that's a little more than the camera, but mm. not much. Mm. So uh, you've got a small enough package that can even go on a gimbal just straight off. Do you, do you know what I mean? You, you've got that flexibility. It can go on a slider, it can go on a jib. So it's re you can move between different platforms really, really quickly. Yes. Now, this morning, just to explain, we're halfway through our uh, open day here. You've been speaking to uh, people who've come and seen the lenses. What's the reaction been? Um, surprise, actually, because until people actually get their hands on, they don't, you know, you see it on the internet, it's very different from actually trying it out for real, do you know what I mean? Mm. Oh, I know very much so with that lens. Putting it on a camera and trying it on a rig and actually seeing how easy it is, you know, to zoom in, jump out, to pull focus, all of those things we've talked about. And also the weight and just to try it on your shoulder. People have been trying it on sticks, but also on their shoulders so they can try different stuff. So I think gen genuine surprise uh, uh, and pleasure that, yeah, it's such an easy piece of glass to work with. Interesting, huh? Interesting indeed. Yeah, I mean, you know, fun enough actually, just, just to prove this is live, Mr. Cameron, um, saying love a bit of parfocal. Um, <laughs> once you've used a parfocal lens on something like this, it's very hard to go back again. Sure. Because um, you do get used to it. Yeah. Um, and okay. having that kind of um, throw in terms of the focus ring, I mean, it's just... It's really nice and easy to pull focus. So while you were all watching that, I was sitting here playing. He's been with playing this. with it for That's the last just, 10 minutes. You know, the whole behind the scenes thing, the, what you don't get to see. Um, you know, when we're rolling VT, guys picking his nose and I'm playing with cameras. Um, it does feel very nice, actually. The, it, it's really nicely damped. It's got a lovely throw to it. Um, it yeah, I think it, it, you know, I wouldn't mind having a play with it, actually. I might have to hire one just to see. Preference rates for you, 150%. Oh, you're so nice. So, uh, <laughs> a few weeks ago, I went to a uh, C200 do in London um, for, with Canon, and I met a very interesting man called Brett Danton, who um, originally shot um, on the Canon C700, a commercial for Land Rover in Australia. And... Uh, he was offered a C200 um, for shooting a commercial for Jaguar. And it was an incredibly interesting and frank presentation, unusually frank, um, in that it was very much admitting that, you know, the C200, the sensor at the C200, because it's the same as the C700, you really could do an awful lot with C200 and did you really need the C700? Mm -hmm. Which was unusual for yes. a firm to say such a thing. To be, to be brutally honest, actually. Yeah. Um, and so it was really interesting. Brett, really, really nice guy. Uh, unfortunately, he's in Australia at the moment because I desperately wanted to try and catch up with him for an interview, which I am going to try and do when he's back because he's doing a few more bits um, in a few weeks' time back here. So I will try and do that. But in the meantime, I'd like to show you the BTS that he produced. And thank you for Canon for letting me show this. Um, so we'll have a look at that and then we can talk about it a little bit.
decided to rush up here and try and shoot this uh, and we we're about to be leaving location but as you can see I think it's worth it because it actually fulfills the, the a script fan. idea. So it shoots 15 stops of latitude. You know, in England on a cloudy day, you don't get 15 stops. You sit inside seven stops of latitude, so you're not really showing what the camera can do. Whereas we come out into this sunlight, you know, you've got snow, you've got clouds, you've got black rocks, you've got dark cars. All of a sudden, we're showing all the latitude that the camera can achieve. So that was interesting. Again, it was. Um, well, you, you kind of have first-hand experience. I mean, uh, we were just talking whilst you were saying that about it. And, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, everybody would turn around and say, well, you know, it was all fixed and everything else. This wasn't. This was him shooting for um, Jaguar. For a client, yeah. You know, sure. and the interesting thing was he said that you know, they only used the C700, I think, once in that whole thing. So they had it there as a backup the whole way through. Um, so, which is a testament to the C200, really is. And, you know, we were talking about bits and pieces that are, are sort of very useful on it. The focus assist, you saw in the video there, basically, yeah, when they, saw the, the, the wheel came in, you could see it was yeah. green, and he said, you know, when we can see it's green, we know no question, it's bang on, that kind of I, thing. I certainly found exactly the same thing when, when I was using it. I've done a couple of bits. Unfortunately, um, the bits that I filmed aren't quite ready for launch. I think that they will be being shown in the next week or two. They'll be being... Um, we'll be able to show them for Christmas. I think we'll be able to show them for Christmas, yeah. Um, equally, sadly, when I did my shoot, I didn't get to go to New Zealand, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Um, my, mine was done down in, in Ditchling. Um, not quite so glamorous, and it wasn't a Jaguar F-Pace. But, um, yeah, mine will be coming out soon. And having used the camera, I... I'm a big fan, and you're absolutely right, and, and Brett's absolutely right, that focus assist, I mean, not just the focus assist for manual focus, but the autofocus capability of the camera mm. as well. Uh, I think Brett was saying that, you know, it tracked the Jaguar f pace mm. as it was coming towards it. Mm. I found when I was tracking people walking, it just follows them. Mm. It makes life so much simpler. Now, of course, you know, you look at something like that, and you think, well, I mean, loads of crew and everything else, and all the kit in the world, but the reality is, is that, and of course, obviously, it's gone to full colouring house and everything else. But interestingly enough, I hopefully, when we get a chance to interview Brett, we'll be able to ask him if we can show it. Because 
He also did a, uh, a quick video. They were in the woods, bored, as you do. And so what do you do when you've got a camera? You go and shoot with it. And he shot with it and literally put it straight onto his laptop, um, passed a lap through it, and then showed it to us. And I thought it was really, really good. I mean, really, really good. And the point is, is that you don't have to have all these massive you know, bits of support and everything yeah. else. You don't have to, if you don't want to, you know, use full cine lenses. You can use normal Canon EF lenses you yeah. want. The point is, it's all about that sensor. It is. It's actually, it's something with the C200, I think. You know, when I, when I did my shoot with it, or the two shoots, it was, my shoots are, are always very much smaller. I'm not a big crew. It, mm. It's me and maybe one other person. And the C200 fits in that realm, Mm. but also fits into a bigger shoot realm as well, mm. where you've got more people. And it's very much, um, it's kind of, it's very much Jekyll and Hyde Beast. And, and that's one of the joys of using that camera. You know that, you know, as a solo shooter or as a small crew, it's never holding you back because it can do so much more. Mm. And then when you get the bigger productions, you can just walk in with it straight yeah, away. And I think as time goes on, as more support comes available for the raw light, mm. that will make life a lot easier for people in terms of, you know, uh, their, their workflow. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the moment, um, I think as, uh, well, didn't Brett say how, how much dynamic range it seemed to, mm. to hold? At the moment, to get the most out of it, you've got to go through the Canon software, the, the Cinema Raw Development. As DaVinci Resolve comes online and, and Premiere and Final Cut, I think we're going to see that evolving and developing and, and you'll be able to get that dynamic range out of, out of any NLE. Mm. No, it's interesting times. So, um, it's no surprise to anybody that we're at Cherry Duck. Um, we love Cherry Duck. We like the people here. They're absolutely okay. wonderful. The facilities are second to none. Feels and like home, really, it does it? kind of feel like our second home now. We even know where the kettle is and where the chocolate bickies are. Absolutely. So, uh, it, um, basically, James, who uh, runs Cherry Duck, has uh, taken on a huge project next door, um, which he's been very busy trying to get finished. And you had a guided tour. I did. I went and had a little look um, earlier on today at The Nest, um, which is what they're calling it. It's a collaborative workspace. Um, and we did a little walk through video so you can see what it is, uh, get an idea of what's there. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. Very interesting. Watch the video, learn all about it. We'll talk more afterwards. Hi, guys. Well, we're down here at Cherry Duck Studios today. We're doing another Facebook Live for Hire a Camera. Uh, and we've caught up with James, owner of Cherry Duck Studios. Uh, and James has shown us this new space that he's been working on, kind of a separate space, a neutral production space, but kind of tied into the studios as well. So James, tell us a little bit about this. What is it? Um, well, last year we managed to buy this big space, actually by the long lease on this big space, 8,000 square feet, right next door to the film studios. And we, what we were trying to do is, as well as giving ourselves somewhere to expand our uh, production services into, we want to attract other like-minded businesses working in the production uh, and creative sort of uh, line moment. into here to actually join us in the space well, on that a, could be in like say, the neutral time. co-working um, sort of base. This is the main working space, I'm guessing. Yeah, this is, this is the kind of production... Well, you're coming as well. ...creative production end of it. Um, uh, Post-production is downstairs, but again, it's really flexible. So mm -hmm. the desks have been put in here right now. They can be moved anywhere. They're big, good, heavy desks. Can, people can bring their own companies in here. They're individuals. They can be... Um, uh, have certain places on their own if you want to get away from everyone else or it can be laid out any which way so but the idea being it, we do want to have co-working the idea is you talk to other people mm -hmm. you hear what they're up to they hear what you're up to you work in a transparent manner uh, respecting each other's space obviously but when you need to make um, phone calls or have private conversations there are breakout areas throughout the entire um, complex where you can go and have some privacy, make some private phone calls, have private meetings, have presentations, have screenings. We've got two screening rooms here. So uh, the whole idea is, is that co-working, but then with private areas to move out to as and when you need them. It's almost like a creative agency hub as well, where, where people can find new work. They're, they're in here doing yeah. their own thing, but they're going to find other projects That's to get right. involved with. And, and dare I say it, they'll have their own clients, and they mm -hmm. work with their own people, and they're looking for, it could be you know production backup, it could be post-production, it could be the studios that are next door, it could be hire camera equipment, it could be anything really. So um, it, it's all based on site here. And obviously the idea is they can just grab it when they need it. Brilliant. Okay, so let's have a look over the back here. These are all bookable uh, 
private meeting rooms, all um, part of being here, so it's no extra cost. Uh, you've got four meeting rooms in total. This is the map room. We've got a big map on the wall here. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll have ten uh, um, spaces around the table there, plus extra chairs. And you've got two more. Your coffee room, which I think you've just panned past, and then the print room at the end, which is all Wapping stories. Wapping's got a huge uh, history, both with print media and the March of the Black Shirts and the Wapping print riots and various other things. So it's just the idea is it just allows a bit of... Um, Creativity is a little bit of, sure. you know, rather than the normal bland office space that yeah, you yeah. get, it's, it's got it's a bit of a, an stuff atmosphere going to on, a bit of a theme. People, people hope you can, can, can let loose their ideas a bit. That's okay. the idea, anyway. Perfect. Okay. And then we head downstairs past one of my favourite features, which I'm sure we're both going to have to use. <laughs> this, is the, this is the door, <laughs> which goes to this big red pole, right? Where did you get this? Did it, did it come out of a fire station or did you have it made? No, we had, we had um, the fireman's pole made. Uh, the architects love the idea, or, or, or some, some people were like not so sure about it. Um, but uh, yeah, and the architects decided it needed to be pink. So uh, it's a pink pole, it's a pink fireman's pole right okay. in the middle of the unit, uh, just for fun. Just for fun. Obviously, use at your own risk, which I'm about to. Okay, and then we get to... Here, yeah, breakout space. So yeah, this is kind of we call it the back cave because inside it is it's certainly a lot lighter than it used to be. But it's all this entire part of the building used to be a big hemp store for rope, uh, okay. which is why you're seeing a lot of rope around the place. Um, before we, um, well, I say over 150 years ago, it was a hemp store. So we've we've taken this space, um, left it very rugged as it was. Mm -hmm. So it's all a little bit sort of rough and ready, but it's, it's a bit of fun. Mm -hmm. And this will be a screening room. So we've got a 65 inch TV here and Dolby surround going in here. All these sofas that are scattered liberally will be sort of lined up so we can have screenings in here. There's a pool table for, for some of the guys to play on. Um, still quite a lot of building works to be done in the sense we've got little areas to sit down, people can sit down and... Mm -hmm. So I guess that leads us nicely on to these desks up and down the middle. Yes, so <coughs> these are, we'll be putting some Cherry up people in here. We'll be, they'll be renting some of the space from here. But we're looking to bring in editors, visual effects artists, um, sound people, people more on the post-production side, perhaps, mm -hmm. that might want to work downstairs. However, they might want to work upstairs, whatever. But the, it, the whole, whole reason being is that this is all networked uh, via Cat 6A and Fiber to our servers. And our okay. servers are something they can, they can take some space on the server. It all backs up, they can take their backups off site or they can upload to their cloud or whatever yeah. they want to do. But the idea being it's more of a, a post production place where, where most people are working in headphones. Okay. And then that, I guess, takes us to these rooms at the back, which are your private editing suite yep. spaces. So th these, we've got four private editing suites in here. These have all got sound counselling glass. Um, the, uh, the idea being is that if you've got a client or a director that you're working with, um, and you want their own private space, you can come in here. Um, the editor is set up here. All the tech is not in yet, and mm -hmm. as you see, it's still a little bit in, uh, in construction. But yep. uh, we'll have, we've got all new tech, so we've got a mixture of um, Mac, iMac Pros coming in and Hewlett Packard something or others, okay. uh, all uh, interconnected onto our servers. And I guess we have one more space to go to. So this is... This is the sound booth, so sound studio. So we've obviously got studios next door. Um, one, of our, one of our studios next door is a sound stage, but it's a much bigger sound stage. We need somewhere that's um, sort of more cosy, that's going to give a better sound. Mm -hmm. And we bought this uh, from a company called Black Cat Mu Music, uh, had it built to order in Spain, and um, slight delay over Catalonia, some issues in Catalonia, <laughs> but eventually it got over here. Built it in the space, got a um, floating floor, uh, very heavy, heavy um, panels, all with rubber in the middle of them, mm -hmm. and it obviously has soundproofing doors, two soundproofing doors. You built a, a room around it as well, so it's completely sound neutral mm -hmm. when you come in here, and you can probably hear from from your voice. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it deadens down the sound in a big way, very and there's a gallery area through the window there. Fabulous, <coughs> fabulous. I, I I really like the sound in here. It almost makes <laughs> me sound normal. Yeah. <laughs> And I guess the question is, what does it cost to take a space down here? So it's a flat fee uh, per desk, which is £400 a month plus VAT. So we're coming in um, well under what we work charge. Mm -hmm. But it's a, an environment that's 
really designed for production, creative and production. So um, not only uh, is it the environment designed for that, you've got people around you, sure. hopefully. So we're, we, we're setting it at that price. We're not looking to make a lot of money out of the property. We're looking to get our costs covered, sure. where we're kind of hoping to add leverages by the, um, the whole communal co-working scenario. Well, thank you very much for showing us around. I mean, it really is a very interesting space. I think it's going to be very successful. Uh, and I look forward to seeing it when it's fully yeah. built. Right? It's uh, www.thenest.space. So, yeah, get in touch. Whoever, get in touch and, and we'll, we'll talk you through it. We'll give you a tour. Fantastic. Thanks Lovely. very much. Thanks very much. Cheers, James. Cheers. It reminds me of the inside of Brenda. Really? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. I, do you know, we should probably explain. We've mentioned Brenda three times now. Yeah. And, and, and not everybody is going to know what Brenda is. So Brenda yeah. is a van. Okay. Um, you're going to see the inside of Brenda very shortly in the next bit of video we've got coming up. So, I mean, I, 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 honestly, I haven't been in there for a few weeks, um, and it's definitely changed since the last time I saw it. Yeah, it I must pop next door and have a look, but it looks amazing. It does. I mean, I'm, I was wandering around, and James was explaining everything to me, and, and I was like, I'm tempted to take a damn space in here. Mm. I think it's going to be really good for creatives in this area mm. to just come together, work together, and, and, you know, be collaborative and actually pick up work. Mm. And, and it's not expensive either. No, it's not. And the thing I like is they're just genuinely nice people. They're not, dare I say it up themselves, they're not inside. They're just exactly. really nice, genuine people. You couldn't find nice people if you tried. So um, we've put a link on the uh, Facebook um, for there. So please do feel free to have a look. Any questions you've got, Jameson's team will be more than happy to answer them. One thing we should just mention, the Mr. Fact, Genge. The fact that this is live. Yes, the fact that, that we're, we're live. live. Hello, Mr. Genge. Hello, Paul. Hello. How are you? Just yes. so you, we, we're not ignoring you. We're not ignoring you, we just keep forget. <laughs> no, we, we keep forgetting. Please, if you're watching and you have a question or you want us to say hello, just let us know and we, we will genuinely pick it up and respond. And also to mention, um, we would like a little bit of feedback, if possible, please. Uh, the Fujinon day we did, um, a couple of weeks ago was very well received. Um, uh, we had quite a few customers here who were very pleased to be able to get their hands on things and Fujinon were also delighted um, by all of those people turning up and being interested and we'd like to do more of them. Um, we are fortunate in that we have reasonably good relationships with the manufacturers and also we have a reasonable amount of stock and we have the wonderful Cherry Duck to be able to um, host these things at. So please, if there are things you're interested in, do get in contact with us because we would like to do more of them. Dave would like them to be something he can play with. Um, but I would. whatever, please let us know what they are and we will try our best to organise them. Indeed, we're thinking uh, touch and try days. If there's kit that you want to get your hands on, kit you want to have a play with. Uh, if there's stuff you want to learn, we're talking about getting some courses up and running as well. I think we yep. mentioned this before. We, we will be getting some, some Canon specific stuff up and running that I'll be doing, yep. but there is scope for doing all sorts of, of other stuff going forward. So just let us know in the comments, by email, Ooh, whatever head. it happens to be, um, and, uh, and we'll get it organised. So then we move on to this versus this. <laughs> so dun, dun, dun. when the A9 came out, I really wanted to see what it was like against a 1DX. Now, funnily enough, I knew someone that had a 1DX who loves his 1DX, who quite frankly doesn't let it out of his sight very often and feels quite affectionate towards it. So who better than to stick an A9 in the hands? Now, you are actually going to see Dave Newton hold something that doesn't begin with a C. You actually... <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say that. So, um, basically, he shot with a Sony. I did. I actually shot with a Sony. It didn't burn my hands either, which was a surprise. Um, and it, it did surprise me in a good way. Go on. Say, 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 say exactly what you felt about it. You liked it. I, I was impressed. I'll, I'll hold my hands up and say I was impressed. It was um, better than I expected it to be. Yeah. I think we, we both were quite surprised at how good it was. But anyway... Rather than us wittering on, uh, let's have We've a look at it. We've already done wittering on. You can watch us now. So, why are we here? Well, these two. 
these two things. We are here because uh, there's a, a lot Sony. of debate. And I have a camera, as usual. Um, there is a lot of debate uh, online, a lot of uh, discussion. And this 1DX Mark II has long been known as the, the king of the sports cameras. Yeah. Um, it, it does what it does incredibly well. Yeah, no, it very much does. Very much does. Well, that's what it's built for. Yes, indeed. It's it's built like a tank. It's built for focus incredibly quickly. There's a huge range of lenses, and uh, and it, it just does that job really, really well. Then Sony came out with the A9, and everybody suddenly went, it's a game changer. I was like, mm, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, should we have a look and see? Um, so. We decided that the only way to really work this one out was to actually just get both of them together, knock them up side by side, and just go and take them out and shoot something. Fortunately enough, um, brands are just down the road, and so we managed to sort ourselves out with media passes, so we've been shooting cars all day long. So let's start with, we've both got hundreds of 400s. Yes, so we've matched up the cameras as much as we can in that they're, you know, the cameras are the cameras, and then we've put 100 to 400mm lenses, they're both 4.5 to 5.6s. Um, so they are as matched as they can possibly be, um, and then we went out and shot with them. We did then push it a little bit. Yep. So we tried using um, some big glass. We had Canon 400mm 2.8 and 800mm 5.6, and Guy has a Metabones adapter for the A9 as well, so we were able to transpose those lenses from the Canon to the Sony and see how that solution performed as well because obviously in some situations 100 400 as great as it is maybe the aperture's not fast enough for you or you know you need mm. a, a bit more on that so putting 400 to 8 on here for example was quite an interesting solution yeah so if we just discuss the 100 to 400s first of all mm. um you can't say anything against this it just it hit it every single time yeah its ability to track was simply yeah, it was remarkable. Yeah, it was impressive really really, really, really impressive good. You know, when we were up the top by Druids and you had the cars coming straight towards you, every single one, you know, shoot 25, 30 shots, bah, 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 yep. absolutely bang on. You couldn't knock it at all. <laughs> and even enough when we actually then put the two times extender on it yep. to make a jot of difference. I wondered whether it was going to slow things down mm -hmm. in terms of the autofocus. It didn't make any difference. It seems to me, even in sort of slightly more awkward, low light, sort of contrasty sort of situations, it's still. Still work very well. Still works really the thing, well. The thing we should say, we, we kind of did essentially two tests uh, in terms of how we use the cameras. We did it in the uh, let's remove us from the equation. Good I. job with me. Fast shutter speed, um, ISO up to give us a rapid shutter speed such that it's not our technique in terms of panning that, that might create or something. Thereof. Just, or lack thereof. Um, and then we did some slower shutter speed panning, being a bit more creative, the sort of stuff you might actually do when you're doing motorsport. And uh, and I think there were some differences. Yeah, I, I very okay. definitely, very definitely. But I think I think it's uh, it's it's a remarkably close call with these. Yes, it really is a lot closer than some would ever believe. Yeah, I mean, until from, you actually get them in your hands. From my point of view, I know this camera inside out. I know how it works and I know it will work every single time mm. I pick it up. This was brand new to me. Yeah. So I don't have that confidence built in and yet I was surprised at just how good it was. Particularly when using its native lens, mm. you know, 100 400 or the 2470 28 that we yeah, that nice. as well. It does just seem to track. It locks on. Mm. And being mirrorless, one of the things the the EVF means It'll that it doesn't out. black out, mm. which is a momentary surprise the first time it happens, you're thinking, hang on, something's off, I'm still seeing through the viewfinder, but actually it's quite nice. The only time I found it a bit of a, an annoyance was when you start going down to the slower shutter speeds, you do start getting image tearing yeah. in the viewfinder, yeah. which is a bit awkward, I mean, as yeah. you'd expect, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're panning quickly with something, you expect there's going to be some kind of, of tearing on a screen like mm. that. Um, which is obviously something you don't get with a DSLR, but equally you're getting blackout in those periods. So, it's and of course, you know, um, in compressed RAW, 20 frames a second. Yes. And it is you. You can tell the difference. It, it is noticeably faster. It is. Obviously, that is compressed RAW, uncompressed RAW, 12. Yeah. Um, but then this is the big elephant in the room, which you know I, I'm sure as cards get quicker. It will help it a bit, but the big elephant in the room today has been having to wait for the thing to get onto the card. Absolutely. I mean, I've been shooting to a CFast card, SanDisk CFast card in the 1DX2, and that's just, it's lightning quick. Yeah. Shoot a burst, it doesn't matter how long that burst is, mm. you stop, you hit play, they're all recorded. They're yeah. there, yeah. done. 
um, really incredibly quick. And even if you switch out a CFast card for a CF card, mm. the buffering time is minimal. But they, it's noticeable with this. This, and, and, and we've had a very fast card in here. We've had yeah. SanDisk, what, you know, 64 gig Extreme Pro U3 yeah. card. Yeah. And still, you shoot a burst of say 30, 40 frames. Mm, you have to wait. Five wait seconds. five seconds, hit play, and it's still got another 20 or so frames to write. Yeah, yeah, which is a real shame. It is a real shame. But the other thing to talk about battery. Battery. Now, that's really surprised both of us. I said to Guy today when we were, when we sort of put the cameras side by side. It's on 17% on the first battery. Yeah, I've shot yeah. nearly 4,000 shots on this today. And it's on 17 So I was convinced that the battery life on that was going to be... Well, I, I put the battery grip on it for a very good reason, because yeah. I had no hope that it was going to last that long. And as I say, 16% is now on. Um, and that's, you've got two batteries in there, yeah. and it's not touched the second battery no, yet. it's still completely full. Which is so un-Sony-like. Anybody that's got the A7s mm. will know you have to have about 50 different batteries sitting in your pocket yeah. to try and keep it going. Um, other thing, weight-wise, we weighed these last night in the kitchen. 500 grams difference between these two setups. Yes. And, and all of that weight is, is here. I mean, yeah. This is just a bigger, chunkier, heavier body. And, and yeah. that comes down to a bit of a durability thing. Though. Oh, yeah. This is so. you know, a nice magnesium alloy body shell. It's built to work in every environment on Earth. It's built to batter your way out of doors if you need to. Um, remains to be seen quite how tough this is in the pouring rain, in yeah. in harsh cold environments. Yeah, no, that's true. Daily Although to be being fair, dashed around. To be fair, you know, we've got 30 or so uh, A7s at the moment, maybe more, and the only problems we ever usually have with them are micro USB connections. Other than that, they're pretty reliable. So they may well be a bit tougher than they look, but I understand what you're getting at is, is the Canon is as tough as it looks, yeah. which is a slightly different thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really been interesting. Then we moved on to putting the two, uh, the 400 and the 800 mil lenses on. We did. And that again was interesting. I mean, obviously naturally the Canon just nailed it every single time. We wouldn't expect any difference to that. The Sony with a mess bands adapter, once you could lock on, it seemed to hold. Yeah. So my feeling when shooting with it was that it would struggle to lock on, so there would be a lot of hunting, and sometimes the, the car's gone. You've completely missed it. I then started giving it a bit of a helping hand by just pre-focusing to where the start point was so that the camera didn't have to do as much in terms of finding the subject. Once I'd done that, it gave it more of a chance. It then locked on, and it seemed to mostly track. It wasn't 100%. I, I can say without doubt it was not 100%, but it was still remarkably good. I think when you look back on things only a year ago um, with the autofocus on Metabones, I mean, we when people used to hire them out, we used to say, if you're doing autofocus, just forget it. A7S, A7S2, A7R2, yep. Canon lenses, autofocus, just forget it. It's not worth doing, it's just rubbish. So it's come a long way since then. Sure. Um, and it's definitely improved. And you know, it's it's nice to see that the manufacturers are actually working with Metabones. Mm -hmm. So it sort of only will improve in the further. But you know, the reality is that Sony needs to bring out bigger glass. Yeah, they need a, a bigger range of lenses. You know, they've now got a camera that honestly does perform remarkably well, surprisingly well. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say almost as well as 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 the hype on the internet suggests. Um, but they still like that range of lenses. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's. You know, it will come. I'm sure it will come, and it'll be interesting to see um, where they go with this going forwards. You yeah. know, is there going to be an A9S? Is there going to be an A9R? Who knows? Are they going to do an actual DSLR with this kind of technology in it? Well, this yeah. is it. I mean, the, the reality is, is this um, dual air sensor is is just so good. Mm. Um, you can say whatever you want about Sony's. If you don't like them, that's fine. But you cannot mock that sensor and its ability to track is just astonishing. Yeah. Yeah, it's been really, really good. Um, so it's been a really interesting um, day, to be honest. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, it has. I, I have to say, we actually uh, finished probably about an hour ago, and we've only just got back, so we've just been having fun. We have. We've just been playing. Um, but um, it's been really, really interesting to actually compare the two side by side. Yeah, I think you know there are other differences, right? There's the difference between a DSLR and a, and a mirrorless camera, mm. and I'm very used to this. I find this a bit small and lightweight in my hand, but. That's a personal choice. Yeah, of course it is. Of course it um, is. And some people will love the fact that this is smaller and, and, and a lighter weight body. I have to say, though, when I shot it vertically, that vertical grip's actually quite nice. Mm. 
it's quite a comfortable vertical grip to hold. It's nicely balanced um, with that 70, uh, the 2470 as well. It, it was really nicely balanced with 2470. I mm. find it with the 100 to 400, it's a bit too lens heavy, a bit too front heavy. That's it doesn't seem to balance as well. Body, exactly, yeah. where the, you know, the centre of balance seems to be just a little bit further back. Um, but that is, uh, that's totally down to personal preference. That said, when this had the 2470 on it, this was actually really quite nice to pan with and, and handle. Oh, it was great fun. And it, it seemed to work much better in an ergonomic capacity. Uh, it, actually, I have to say, the, um, the image stabilisation as well yeah, it's good. was impressive. So with the 2470, we had it down to... 15. Uh, no, I had it down to a tenth of a second. <laughs> I was trying to pan at a tenth of a second. Um, and, okay, panning is incredibly hit and miss, but when it hit, mm. it hit, um, which is remarkable. Yeah, no, there's some nice images. Even I managed to do a few of the images. You did. Oh, it's been really Practice makes perfect. You yeah. listen to my advice. You got your hips in the right place. Yeah, exactly. So, what do we think? We think Sony's done a pretty good job with it, to be fair. I think they have done a pretty good job. I'm impressed. I can't say I'll be switching. No. Um, but... But all of this technology can only push everybody else to you know keep going forwards and keep going forwards. Yeah, and we do have to remember, this is what, uh, now a two-year-old mm. camera? Mm. Yeah, it's a two-year-old camera, and this is a, a brand new camera. Yep. So we've got two years of development. Mm -hmm. Be interesting to see where this goes next. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Time for a cup of tea, I think. I we'll think see you soon. So there you go. He's not going to change his one DX quite yet, but it did open up your eyes, though, didn't it? Oh, it certainly did. Um, uh, you know, as I said before, we, we we played that video. I was genuinely impressed with with the A9. I won't be. I won't be giving this up um, anytime soon, but I think this is a remarkably good camera and, and it's capable of, of delivering the results um, for a lot of people. And most importantly, it pushes things forward. It does. It, it gives another option in the market. You know, as I said in the film, uh, this has been the camera of choice for sports, but mm. now there's something else that's going to push it forwards, drive it forwards, and we know that competition in the market is always a good thing. Faster cards, 200 mil 28 on, or oh, 400 mil 28 on the front. It's going to be interesting. That, isn't would, it? that would be nice. That would be nice. So that's it. Um, I'm afraid we're at the end of it, which is probably a good thing because if you've been watching for the whole hour and 10 minutes, whatever, you're probably fed up we've been and sick of the sight of us. So we will bid you farewell. We will be back before Christmas. We will be back before Christmas. Um, we have some other ideas of where to go and shoot and what to do, which mm -hmm. we will show you next month. And until then, we bid you farewell. We do. It's goodbye from him. And it's goodbye from me. <laughs> See you later. See you later. Bye.